infallible ranking system I for appreciate you saying movie that. stars. Infallible. I it doesn't it hasn't steered me wrong since I've thought about it mm, four days ago. <laughs> So four days ago, what did you come up with? What did you share with me? I said that in order to be a true A-lister, a true movie star, you have to have two of three skills, personality traits. I guess traits, traits. two of three traits. Uh, you have to be sexy, funny, and or charismatic. But you have to have two, at least. And often a lot of stars have had three or have three uh, when i was trying to think of who those three people would be i thought of like carrie grant that is somebody yes. anybody would say is funny charismatic and sexy uh, especially for the ladies back in the day carrie grant uh johnny depp had all three um maybe doesn't have it anymore i don't know he's kind of on everybody's shit list right now but sexy charismatic funny julia roberts sexy charismatic funny then i was thinking like tom hanks I would never say he's sexy. I don't think anybody would say sexy, but he's definitely charismatic, funny. Tom Cruise, you'd never say he was funny, but you would say he was sexy and charismatic. It's very interesting. An actor we were just talking about before we started recording was Jason Momoa, somebody I hate, but we have sexy, we have funny, and I think people would argue charismatic, even though it, he doesn't work for me. I, it, it doesn't, it's not, it maybe not perfect because sometimes you just can't tell. Is he charismatic or is he funny? Right. But Ryan Reynolds, for a fact, yes. is all three. He and is that's all three. why we love him. Right. Yes. Ryan Gosling, because we always talk about Gosling, because I just, I do not see why people put him in leads in movies now here's the other thing about those three talent for me is a given i because I, I do think people would hear those three things and say well, what about talent i think ta anybody can be in a movie if directed and used appropriately they can be good in a movie i think that's just a truth because anybody who's really good and has talent for it can also suck in a movie sometimes so i really do think it's up to like are they used appropriately and who and are they directed well anybody can be a good in a film so talent to me is a given so i really think it's those other three things because like ryan gosling has talent i'm not saying he doesn't but I think he's just sexy. That's it. I don't think he's yeah. charismatic. And he's definitely not funny. It's an interesting way of pointing out these really popular one-horse pony or one-horse carrot. What is that phrase? One-horse pony? One-trick pony? One-trick ponies. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, where they have to be used correctly or they go terribly wrong. Just like the actor that I really don't care for in the movie last night where would you put Jared Leto? Yeah, he was actually one we were trying to think about, too. Because uh, I don't know if he's sexy. Is he? I think, yes, he's universally called sexy. And it's been a while since you've seen him look like a normal guy. But for bits and pieces of the Morbius movie, he looks normal. And you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot. That man is attractive. Yeah. Most of the time, he does not try to be attractive. <laughs> right, right. I, I guess my point is, is that if they don't have two of the three, they're imposters <laughs> because they shouldn't be leading for as, as far as Hollywood's concerned and how Hollywood has been for the past hundred years or more. Those aren't true movie stars. Why are they leading our franchises? Because they don't have at least two of the three. So this is Aaron and Justin talk sequels. We are in the middle. Do you like how I just segued right in? Yeah, we are in the middle of covering our longest and strangest franchise to date today we continue talking about the halloween franchise and i want to kind of do a quick summary since there's so many episodes involved in this series this is a really weird franchise because there's never been so many endings to a franchise that i can remember today we're going to be talking about halloween 5 the revenge of michael myers and halloween 6 the curse of michael myers in these end what many consider to be a three-part trilogy wedged in there called the thorn trilogy so we already talked halloween 1 and 2 which is it's the first little mini story line that's you could watch part one and two and never watch any of the others and you get a whole story. Yeah, the Laurie Strode story with Jamie Lee Curtis effectively begins and ends in those two movies. Very successful. They made about 90 million between the two of them ballpark. And this is late 70s, early 80s money we're talking here. That's gold. Yeah, huge hits. So then they take the franchise that was doing really well, take it in a completely new direction with Halloween 3, which is a very convoluted movie that we have strong and differing opinions on, mm. which did okay. In theory, it made, I think, 17-ish, maybe 11-ish, one of the two, in the teens. But they, again, were like, that's not Michael Myers' money. So they bring back Michael Myers, and we get this loosely connected series of movies 
that build on each other in really, really weird ways that we're going to talk about. Halloween 4, 5, and 6, if this was made today, it would be very simply the Star Wars new sequel trilogy. <laughs> that kind of feedback online yeah. is what we would have experienced with these. We have four movies directed by completely different people, written by completely different people. Three movies. That Three, sorry. But they all just do their own weird shit in between while only paying attention to bits and pieces of the previous ones. And then you get the showstopper, which I really hope that The Rise of Skywalker, I can look back on it in 20 years and appreciate it as much as I appreciate Halloween 6 for all the batshit craziness that's in there. It's possible, but... See, I think calling these three films a trilogy is what it's like a, a misnomer it makes people think that they're supposed to go together where i really think four and five were intended to go together and like you said they're always stopping and starting so they ended it after five or they're supposed to end it after five but then a couple of years later here comes a new writer to say i think we can do better and, and maybe make this one fit in but try to flesh out some problems that happen in four and five and that's how we got six so i kind of feel like even six is almost a retelling of four and five to just not to retell but to try to make it make sense and to save the whole halloween franchise overall for good or ill i'm not really sure it always feels like they're trying to get back to the original two's money like it feels like that's their goal and they keep changing things up to see if they could spark interest and that really doesn't happen until our next episode when we cover halloween seven and eight but to recap halloween four michael myers after 10 years of being in a coma from being very badly burned, goes back to Haddonfield and tries to kill his niece. 4, 5, and 6 are a fun, self-contained story in that you don't need to have seen the other movies to really appreciate what's happening. And when you think about it that way, Halloween 4 is almost a redo of the first Halloween. Yeah. Where we have this killer, and this time he's just a famous killer, not an anonymous, an anonymous killer going and trying to hunt down and kill a little girl and we get to see the writer and director make choices about how that small town would react so this time we have a posse of people taking the law into their hands and helping the sheriff try to find this killer because that's something that's very small town that's the one where michael falls down the well yeah they it's like a mine salt shaft. mine shaft they shoot him down there he falls down and like you said they're always like ending it they're acting they're like he's killing. dead and then whatever was driving michael to kill is now transferred into his niece jamie and then she ends up what uh, i thought she killed her stepmom at the very end much in the classic way young michael killed his sister in the first movie so it was kind of a replay of that yeah and so they're setting up halloween five where Jamie could very easily be the new killer, but they chickened out and they totally chickened out. They had Michael get away and have a hobo. He was like a hermit. Heal him. Because he had hermit. a hobo, you wouldn't have a home. A hermit would have a home. <laughs> <laughs> and he helps very because like he falls down the mine shaft so what they do in five is that they say oh after he fell in the mine shaft they threw dynamite or some shit down there to try to really kill him but he <laughs> crawled out and it just so happened to be connected to a river he floats down the river the hermit finds him and nurses him back to health because that's what hermits do and that actually ties in pretty well with the the rob zombie reboots you know what it's a it's a total homage to bride of frankenstein let me tell you Really quickly. In Frankenstein, uh, Dr. Frank Frankenstein creates a monster. It goes and terrorizes the community. People don't really understand it. It kind of doesn't understand what it wants to do either. It accidentally kills a girl. So they burn it alive in a uh, windmill. So then Brad of Frankenstein starts. He's burning alive in the windmill, but he escapes. And kind of in a river thing. And he gets found by this old hermit that helps nurse him back to health. That's very cool. I there you go. not really yeah. partaken in it's any of the that best frankenstein horror. film by far so it's a really good one anyway they do a bunch of junk jamie is not talking she's in a mental hospital because she tried to kill her stepmom i thought she straight up killed her that's yeah. if you listen to our last podcast like we're pretty confident that she <laughs> killed her stepmom we were pretty confident <laughs> that she killed her but apparently she didn't and I think the writer was like, okay, well, if we're not going in the direction where Jamie's evil, she can't be. She can't, she, she just needed to attempt to kill her. 
stepmom and that's why she's been in this children's ward you know f- for a year right i think it's been a year it's picked up although we had if i don't know if you recall in our last podcast we were trying to guess what would happen and you thought that they'd pick up 10 years later where she was older and your guess at what happened in five actually kind of fits six better whereas i was more closer to what was going on in, in five and that i thought it'd be a year later uh, where jamie would be in a mental ward and stuff like that anyway yeah i forgot about the predictions <laughs> The problem I have with five is five is my least favorite so far. Yeah, of me too. The movies, um, it's boring. It's repetitive. Mike chases Jamie around and tries to kill her. He kills some people. This is the one with the barn, right? We get the classic pitchfork through the body and then cutting the head with the scythe. That's fun. It's, you know, Jamie's Lori's daughter, and Lori was killed in like a car accident so it's just been jamie and the fourth movie which i actually liked the fourth movie quite a lot because it felt very polished and it was it kind of stuck with the logic and then it ended with a surprise that she was now the new michael myers so five totally like pussies out (laughs) for lack of a better term and just tries to restart it again jamie's in the hospital she's a mute michael comes back into the picture because i think he wasn't awake for that year I think he woke up at Halloween and went back to Haddonfield looking. Where's Loomis in this one? God, this is so forgettable. It was hard. It is. I don't know. Loomis gets involved somehow. I can't remember how. (laughs) I know more about six uh, stands out to me more than five does. But the thing about four is that Jamie had this uh, Rachel, this stepsister, her foster sister. So then Rachel is in five, but she gets killed kind of immediately. So then her friend Tina is the one who's now like the protector of Jamie. But she's the least interesting of all of Rachel's friends, I thought. And yeah, it just kind of becomes the whole Michael's trying to kill Jamie, but he's first going through all all of people that were related to Jamie. So we get the the murder in the barn and stuff like that. And Loomis is doing his thing where he's trying to stop Michael, but failing miserably. And while this is going on, there's a man in black that's walking around. Yes. And the movie never explains. Yeah, because they decided to take that stuff out. It was in at some point? It was part of the script, at least. They didn't want to flesh it out, but they left the man in black in for some reason. But he well, becomes cause... important at the end, at least, without any explanation. Yes. So let's cut straight to the end of five. <laughs> if, watch this yeah. movie if you want. We don't recommend it. It's it's just kind of painful. There is a setup to capture Michael Myers at his old house. And it goes bad. Loomis is there being a weirdo. Loomis actually goes crazy at a moment and starts using Jamie as bait. And there's like a chase through the house where like Michael's almost getting Jamie and he like is stabbing her in the leg. And I don't know. It's just this kid, uh, Daniel Harris again. And, um, you know, I mean, she brings her A game to it best she can. And so Loomis beats Michael with a board and then has a stroke on top of him the cops lock up michael and they promise jamie that he's never gonna hurt anyone ever again but then what happens aaron uh the man in black goes and busts michael out of the jail so a person we don't know and don't care about takes the killer out of jail and then the movie just fucking ends with jamie finding the empty cell realizing that michael is gone it makes me feel bad that we're just blowing through this like this isn't us normally we we want to be in depth about this but this movie was so forgettable (laughs) this movie was so forgettable but it also like jamie has a psychic connection with michael if we haven't talked yeah i think that helped Michael know where to find her and why it put him on his murderous rage again to try to kill his family members because of that link. And that's this trilogy really goes into some weird territory with how to treat Michael and his powers. Having him have a psychic connection with this little girl is left up in the air. They never explain it. I, but Because I think that like what they should have done was made her the new Michael Myers and went on this psychological journey with her. People trying to help her like Loomis or whatever, but she breaks out and starts killing people and then she grows older and puts on the mask or something like that's probably what they should have done but they didn't want to do any of that so they're just like well let's take a little bit of kind of where we were going with four but just kind of like make uh, it worse don't really flesh it out let's just have a little bit so uh why did she try to kill her stepmom uh she has some sort of psychic link with michael it drove her temporarily insane you're absolutely right and i would love that movie and that's what they should have done like they do all this reboot sequel stuff now where we're just gonna pretend all eight of the old movies don't count and we're gonna go off the first one i want somebody to make a halloween five again go back and just give it another go try the story out again 
I don't know if it's anybody probably would, too would care for But that. what's striking about what you just said and what their intentions probably were is that the cover of Halloween 5 features Jamie in the clown costume yep. as after she had killed her injured her stepmom up until the point where they made the poster they're still thinking about it and then they just never did it yeah like maybe she's trying she's now a murderous killer but she needs help in her destructive ways so she's trying to find her uncle michael you know like maybe that would have been the movie <laughs> anyway so yes we usually cover movies a little more in depth and uh, talking about the plot but you know people I, I might be bored with that talk anymore anyway. about this film yeah it's just bad this movie again does not find halloween money uh, most of these movies have a budget the first couple were just million or two million but most of the budgets going forward are five million but this one only brought in 11 million in the box office and so that means that the halloween series took a break i feel like this ended it once again like they felt like ooh, put the nail in the coffin this thing is done oh well yeah i mean we had a little cliffhanger ending where he got broken out but for all intent and purposes uh, it's pretty much done nobody cares about halloween anymore it's not gonna make any money but then in like 94 or whatever you have this writer named daniel farrens and he puts together this whole like if you want to do another halloween this is how we can do it and he just was like such a fan that he was like you were going to this whole thorn rune thing in five but you kind of didn't do much but how about we just we include all that and i can bring everything together in this sixth movie and he convinces the producers to start work on it i guess that's basically i think what happens yes so six years later we get halloween six uh which has about 12 different titles because it is another one of those classically problematic productions yeah reshoots and rewrites while they're making it and the script wasn't really finished when they started making it all that all that classic hollywood type stuff but yeah i think it's originally called halloween 666 and then it was called halloween 6 the origin of michael myers and then uh here's another thing the, the because of that problematic production i think the writer was the one that suggested to the producer why don't we call this the curse of michael myers because <laughs> it's been a giant curse working on this thing but the producer was like that's good <laughs> there was an original version of this movie that tested really poorly with audiences mm -hmm. and it's another one of those uh, Snyder cut situations where everybody wanted to see it I don't know who this everybody is but everybody wanted to see it and they released it and you can buy it on blu-ray it's crazy I'm sure the one and... I saw was the theatrical version yeah, I saw the theatrical version too yeah. because it makes no mention of the child in this movie being an incest baby. Right, and I right, believe right, right. the producer's version keeps the incest baby in. Uh, audience, if there's no incest baby in the producer's cut, if you've seen it, tweet at us. We want to know this because... I don't think I'll ever watch it. I watched this one twice because there was so much time in between when we recorded that uh, I'd forgotten all of it. But I was not going to watch 5 twice because I just did not enjoy it. See, no memory of 5, but I enjoyed this one so much because it's so bizarre that I didn't yeah. need to watch it again. It's still pretty fresh in there. Well, let's go through. Let's get into this one a little bit. Five's a little forgettable, but this one has got, even though it's a mess, it's got things to enjoy in a very 90s kind of way. Yeah, I like this movie and I don't think i could defend myself in court because here's here's the premise and here's the opening ladies and gentlemen not only was michael taken that night six years ago when he was broken out of prison by the man in black yes jamie was also kidnapped six years ago that night and they've been hostages or prisoners of a cult this entire time and this cult has used michael myers as their tool it's a rune like an old marking yes and it's called thorn yes. and it has to do with halloween the way the original halloween was pagan rituals and evil and the dead rose whatever you know the way they really thought of halloween and this cult is obsessed with controlling michael through this rune called thorn and it makes him kill his family members and gives them power that's how i understood it but that's yeah, it's... it they almost treat it like yeah it's a cult thing but we're all doctors and scientists in our own way and we're fascinated with this and that's why we've been putting michael on this kind of trail of murder kind of an explanation for why michael is supernatural yes he's supernatural because he is possessed by this rune and in order to pass it on they must sacrifice the youngest member of the 
family. So there's no youngest member other than Jamie. So they make Michael and her, which is in the producer's cut, not this cut, have an incest baby. We so don't who know is who the, the father and not the producer's cut? They don't say. We just yeah. start the movie with Jamie being pregnant and having a baby. It's almost like she was um, artificially inseminated or something. Like the cult made her pregnant is kind of how it felt to me. So Because it's been six years, so she's like 17 now or something. And she's giving birth at the beginning to this baby that's uh, her. This baby. Well, it's not though. Because you always say if it's not in the movie, it doesn't count. It's true. So it's, true. it's not in the movie. Because this is the cult's new thing. Kill this baby and... Th- what? <laughs> now I'm trying so, to So <laughs> Michael's going to kill the baby. Yes. And then we'll get to it. But then by killing little Steven, they will be able to transfer the power to Daniel. The, who's another kid that is a relative kid. of Lori and thereby a relative of Michael who hasn't entered the picture yet. But yeah, okay, I got you. But why wouldn't they just kill? I don't know, man. I guess you can't kill Jamie, but after she gives birth, you could kill Jamie and then use Steven. And then you'd have an even younger model than Danny, who's already like 14 or something, right? That's interesting, yeah. So they have to have a new baby just to kill and then get another guy who happens to be related as well to be the new... I don't know. It's just it was a, it's just it's just a convoluted mess right from the beginning. Yeah, it's convoluted, but God, it makes it more interesting for better or for worse. They're... They're going with it. And so the nurse that helped Jamie give birth is like, this is fucked up. Here's the door. <laughs> yeah. We're going to get Take you out baby, of here. Get out of yeah. here. So she runs with the baby. Yeah. And Michael is then tasked with finding her. And his son. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah but... <laughs> and finding him and the baby, yeah. which gets named Steven a little bit later. Uh, yeah. So then... He does. He's because even though he walks and she drives, he drives too. I guess I don't know, but he yeah, somehow finds Michael, her. Yeah, Michael driving again. Obviously, yeah. that's how he catches up. How he drives, but yeah, she's at a bus station. That's right. And the bus station is like empty, and she's scared. She's hiding in a bathroom stall, and she hides the baby. Yeah, but she, but before she hides the baby, she does what anyone in the mid nineties would do when they're in trouble. You call the local <laughs> shock jack on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she calls into a radio station. It just so happens that this guy named Barry Sims, who's a definite Howard Stern impersonator, he has a shock jock radio show. The other thing that's going on in Haddonfield is that uh, it's been five year, five or six years or whatever since the last murder of Michael Myers, and they've banned Halloween. So yes. Halloween's coming back. So Barry Sims, the radio shock jock, is talking about how Halloween is coming back for the first time in years at Haddonfield. Uh, what's the deal with this Michael Myers thing? Do you believe it? What do you think caused it? Is it real at all? Blah, 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 blah. She calls into that radio station and asks for Dr. Loomis. I need Dr. Loomis's help. If anyone can hear me, I need Dr. Loomis. If Loomis, if you're listening for some reason, because I know you love Barry Sims' show, please come and help me. And then Michael's on her case, so she hangs up, runs into the bathroom, hides the baby, pretends to have the baby, escapes again. Michael's chasing her and the baby. He ends up killing Jamie, pitchfork, in a barn. I've got the baby now, realizes it was all a diversion. The baby's, he doesn't know where the baby is because he's an idiot and he's just this killing machine. But we then cut, I think, to see Dr. Loomis, who's yes. visited by an old uh, doctor friend of his called Wynn, who wants yeah, him to come Wynn. back to the insane asylum and, and be a doctor again. Uh, he's listening to the radio show and he hears uh, Jamie's plea to him. All right. And then at that same time, there's another kid. Uh, named Tommy. Yeah. Who's also hearing it. So go ahead. Tommy is the little boy that Jamie Lee Curtis was babysitting on that original night in the original Halloween movie. They brought him back. And yes. You know, that night left him pretty fucked up. You know who I thought he was going to be? And this is something we didn't talk about in five is that I thought he was going to be Billy, who was the kid that befriended Jamie in the insane asylum or the little children's ward that she was in. And they had to escape together and he had to like a stutter. I thought he was going to be the older Billy, but instead Uh, they went for the older Tommy. Whatever. It didn't really matter. It didn't really matter. Right, right. he spends all of his time thinking about Michael Myers. And yeah, he he's a little effed up by it ever since. He lives in a, what's, it's a home for kids without parents. I'm not sure. I guess it, it just kind of felt like he was just renting from this old lady named Mrs. Blankenship. That's all. It didn't really right. 
seem to be i don't know I, like i read something about that but i was like i thought he was just renting a house from this old lady that's all and he really lives need to know. next door to the strodes or across directly the street across from the, from the michael myers house is where he lives who yeah. is now inhabited by a new strode family who were relatives of jamie yes. there's kara or kara probably kara and her son danny and then her parents deborah and john I got these names. They all live in the Michael Myers house. John's abusive father. Yeah, Deborah is a, a weak little uh, woman who can't stand up to her husband. Uh, Kara is played by a woman, uh, Marianne Hagen or something like that. Marlene Hagen. Uh, I don't know, whatever her name is. But I thought she was cast pretty well. Like she was clearly a troubled youth and had da- and had Danny like at a young age and her parents were always disappointed in her but now she's out of money and she that's why she moves home with them and he's and the father's just openly abusive to them about how horrible her life is and how shitty she is and she also has a brother who's like a teenager and he has a girlfriend there we are tommy lives yeah. across from them he ends up here in the radio show as well while he's yeah. peeping on kara isn't that right around the same time that's right yeah yeah, he's a little bit of a peeper, that Tommy. But it's okay. He's disturbed, so they let it go. I think this is the <laughs> only movie that this guy was ever in. It's his first movie. And people might not recognize the name. It's Paul Stephen Rudd. Yeah, is the who plays actor. Tommy. Yeah. Uh, full first, middle, and last name. Um, I think that's the only time we ever get that. Right. After that, he drops the Stephen because it makes him <laughs> sound like a serial killer. And the career of Paul Rudd was born. It was yeah. nice seeing this young man in this movie. It was, except he is not good in it. That's nope. what I gotta say. He, <laughs> but because like we all know Paul Rudd and how he's like he's funny, so he's a great actor now because he plays up his lovable funny side, even when he's doing more serious stuff here and there in movies. But in this movie, he's like straight up disturbed he's always grinning when he's not trying to like the way he's delivering lines he should be a comedian but he's not allowed to be in this movie I, it's hard to explain how bad is he is interesting. in this film <laughs> like <laughs> because he's trying might... to be so serious but it doesn't come off well goes back to the scale the actor scale from earlier so he's got the talent and if he had never figured out what his strengths were, he would have just bombed and failed like a lot of actors. But something changed. I think Clueless is what he pretty much got like the next year or maybe two. He was in Romeo and Juliet, I remember, like with Claire Danes, but he didn't really do much. You know, he just had to appear. Right. But Clueless was really the one where I think he was kind of able to play up a funny role. And that that is what definitely launched him into who we know him today. I haven't seen that movie in forever, but I, I remember enjoying the film. Uh, and it was really funny. But at the same time, it always was weird to me that uh, they were like stepbrother and sister. And then they end up together at the end. That's fine. They're not related <laughs> by blood. God. That's fine. You're such a judge. Listen to this judgmental son of a bitch. We got to watch Clueless again. Anyway. Yeah, we should. Go ahead. Clue. 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 And then Clueless. That would have been yes. great. Anyway, uh, so oh, Paul Stephen Rudd is a weirdo who's obsessed with michael myers and he has this theory about the rune and thorn he's done the research he's figured it out the movies haven't the movie has not and so he makes his way to the train bait the bus station because he's listening to a reel by reel recording he made of the radio show because he always tapes uh barry sims shows he loves he listens to it all the time Makes and total sense. he is like Columbo and he's listening and he hears train stuff. Like he hears the announcement from a train thing. So he realizes that Jamie called from the train station. Yeah, and he goes there. A very normal thing for a 16, 17 year old to do is to find a baby in a yeah. bathroom and then take it. Well, he assumes it's Jamie's baby, right? But how does he know that? Yeah, pretty big assumption. Takes it home. Gives it a new name. Yeah, your name is Steven now. (laughs) And basically decides that he's going to raise this That's my middle name, although you won't know it when I become famous because I'm going to drop it. Yeah, so he knows that um, he's got to find Loomis as well. So he takes the baby that's now his baby. Yeah, he takes his baby. And he goes and finds Loomis. Well, I think he just happens to see Loomis at the hospital because he goes to the hospital to, to be like, my baby needs help. I need to register this baby know. is mine. Yeah, uh, and then Loomis. But then the security guards are after him because he made a big 
the funniest th- line is like, I just need some help. Like he screams, but it's hilarious. It's such a bad line reading. So the security guards chase him out of the hospital, but Loomis is now aware there's a baby, but he doesn't really know the connection. I don't know, whatever. But then he hooks up with Kara, who's the Strode, living in the old Michael Myers house and her son, Danny. And then they start all talking. And I think Paul Rudd fills them in on who Michael is. He's back. I think he wants this baby. We're all going to be killed if we don't do something about it. Well, in the meantime, Michael is killing Deborah. Yes, the mom. He goes back to the Myers house. He's not happy about people living in his old house. That's why Kara, Tommy has Kara and Danny at the boarding house. Because, oh, because the mom's dead. Because the mom. And they see that? Dead. Is that what I, happened? I can't remember. So the man that just took a baby and named it Stephen takes the chick that he was peeping on at the beginning of the movie with her son Naturally. and explains to her that the rumor of Michael Myers is true. And that I actually believe it's an ancient druid curse. At this point, Kara politely says, thank you for your time. Takes Danny, leaves town forever, and never comes back. The movie's over. Because that's what a rational person would do in yeah. that situation. Well, her mom just got killed, right? So I think she's a little iffy about this whole thing. She might as well listen to Tommy. He knows yeah. what he's talking about. He has dealt with Michael Myers before. And then the boarding house lady a boarding house i guess is like an apartment house yes yeah, i would just say uh, his so mrs landlord. blankenship then reveals to them that she was babysitting little michael myers the night that yes. he murdered his sister right michael had voices in his head telling him to do it much in the same way that danny apparently danny we haven't really talked about him much but he's also hearing voices and the other thing that's going on is that barry sims goes to Haddonfield to celebrate how Halloween's returning and does a live radio broadcast from the town. And this really only leads to him just getting killed by Michael Myers. That's really it. Now, to get to the ending of this movie, I think we've kind of set the stage where it's then revealed that Mrs. Blankenship is, is one of the cult members, the, the, the cult of Thorn. And the man in black that we saw briefly in number five, who let Michael loose from prison or from jail and then apparently kidnapped him and Jamie and impregnated Jamie is the Dr. Wynn, who's the doctor that was trying to get Loomis to come back to the hospital. They drug and kidnap Loomis, Tommy, Kara, and Danny, Danny. and Steven. Yes. So they all, and they take them back to the hospital. Yes. Like where this all began. And they're going to do their cult ritual now. Uh, for some reason, they keep Tommy and Kara alive. Because what, as you explained, they're going to kill Steven in order to pass Michael's killing rage onto Danny. Right? Yes. But they keep everybody alive for some reason. And Wynn even wants Loomis to be part of the, of the cult. And says, like, you got to come back. You're the first person that ever recognized the evil that was in Michael. You should be a part of what we do. But Loomis doesn't really want anything to do with it. But Loomis is upset about it because he's been trying to stop that for several movies now. And right. he's not going to just suddenly change his mind at the end of the sixth yeah, one. Yeah, and he realizes his colleague has been instrumental in keeping Michael on a murderous rage and that angers him as well i guess so this all comes to a head since they're all at the hospital they all get loose right so they're able to save the baby tommy and kara get loose don't they yes yeah. and michael's chasing them around because michael is still in the thrall of this cult yeah michael's really just doing what this cult wants oh but michael helps them out because michael kills the doctor dr Wynn, and all the people that were doing the the ritual on Stephen. and my guess is that since Stephen was his baby, that oh, Michael yeah. was not having any more of it. And he wasn't by the rune anymore, maybe? I don't know. So Michael kills all of them. And Tommy and Kara go and they rescue the kids, Stephen yeah, and, and Daniel. Daniel. And then Tommy, like, injects Michael with tranquilizers or something like that. And then he yeah, beats something. him with a pipe. <laughs> yes. So Paul Rudd is really is the one that takes down Michael Myers. But... He's just like, like every movie, they just believe him to be dead, I guess. Like he beats him unconscious with a lead pipe, but it's Michael Myers. Like that's not going to take him down. Well, and they run away and the movie ends with Michael's mask on the floor and you hear Loomis screaming in the background. Okay. Tommy, Kara, Steven, 
and Danny are all in a truck, and they're like, we're going to get the fuck out of here. Come with us, Dr. Loomis. And Loomis is like, no, I I have more uh, business to take care of inside. That's the best Donald Pleasance <laughs> that I've ever heard. How uh, long have take, you been practicing that? Take care of the the baby. And then he goes inside. And yeah, it's like they wanted to end it again on a weird cliffhanger. So like, does Loomis killed by him? Or what was he going to do when he went back inside? I don't know. The ghost of Donald Pleasance just walked behind you, gave a thumbs up, and then he walked away. That was was petting a cat. (laughs) in Because he was uh, Blofeld and James Bond. Anyway, uh, yeah, but speaking of which, he died uh, shortly after making this film. Yep. So the movie's dedicated to him. Yes. And that's it. Their fates are unknown. What happens to Michael and yeah. Lewis? And uh, who knew? I thought this then continued into H2O, but from what I've read about H2O, and I guess I never saw it. Maybe I did 20 years ago or more. This is it. Like, they forget episodes three, four, five, and six. Yeah, they kind of treat them as they're not there. But I don't know if they, I don't know if they explicitly call it a reboot sequel, like, because they go out of their way to say she faked her death. Oh, okay. To escape from Michael, just to be safe. I see. But she left her daughter behind. That's see. That's the thing. They just forget that she had it, right? They just they they for all intent and purposes. I gotta stop saying that. This just continues right after two. HGO, right? That's what I'm hoping. So yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I've read. Did you like Curse of Michael Myers? I did. It was. It wasn't a good movie, but. Yeah, they tried stuff. They tried stuff other than a masked man running around and killing people, and then somebody stopping him. I mean, they still did that. I liked how the Halloween entered the '90s. Like, it's not good, but I enjoy the the music video editing and the the bad music choices and the grunge sound to everything and the way Paul Rudd was like a '90s guy. I like all that stuff, and that movie's got a little more polished and a little more convoluted. And like, I enjoy all that, but I know it's not. It doesn't make a good film. What's the word for? snapshots of their eras yes Um, for sure because following this franchise we really we get to watch the horror medium evolve i mean it's going to continue to be even more so true with our next episode because and i haven't watched these yet so i'm just guessing and we're going to make our predictions these are the post scream horror movies for sure that they retool everything and have an impact on horror for the next 10 years after that we've only talked about doing the eight but man i really feel like we need to cover halloween and halloween kills we can, we certainly can i've seen halloween and i have about a half hour left to go on halloween kills i haven't seen either of them and i'm actually i'm actually enjoying kills more than i did the other really? one it's just because they didn't have to they didn't have to like wreck on everything. They didn't have to take time to explain where Lori is now, why that whole sister thing was just a rumor. They just got right into it and uh man, it's like a fun movie. Considering how much time, how many times this franchise reboots itself, it only seems appropriate that we do something on that because it's the same thing. It's the same thing right. they're doing. And I think that's... I See, I just consider H2O and Resurrection a reboot of the original because it forgets uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6. But the zombie ones are definitely a remake. Yes, the zombie ones are remakes. We can leave them out. I liked them for whatever weird... Again, Rob Zombie, mental health is important. We ask that you talk to somebody... That's all. Um, so Halloween has been anthologized, and then it was rebooted, and then I guess failed at that. So then it was remade, and then it, the original was rebooted again. Like, that's this franchise so far. If we think about Freddy, we have the original movies, and then we have that meta, The New Nightmare. The New Nightmare, yeah. Which I like. I like that film. It was meta before meta was meta. You, yeah, you know what totally. the meta meta? Yeah. Um, what did they do after that? That's where it goes off the rails and we have Freddy versus Jason. Yeah, I think that was the last one. Is just after that they did the fun fan movie Freddy versus Jason, which is everything's completely connected. Like they never really restarted right. it until that remake. And then they do the remake and the remake was people didn't like it. I I was fine with it. Yeah, I thought it was fine, but it was pointless. The first movie I think is pretty solid, so it didn't improve on it in any way. The new Halloweens are the end game of the what do you call them the teens the aughts it's not the aughts it's the teens 
of the reboot of classic horror. So we have the Texas Chainsaw reboot, we have the Nightmare reboot, we have the Friday the 13th reboot, and the Halloween reboot has been the most successful because it stays the truest to the roots, and it's less of a reboot, but more of a reboot sequel. Yeah, but also because of the star power behind it. I mean, you got Jamie Lee Curtis reprising the role that made her famous and then you got the guys that are like uh, danny mcbride and uh, the director like so there's more to it than just your average we're gonna hire a foreign a european music video director like they did in curse of michael myers because that's what you did in the 90s and you just bring in this no-name person who i'm sure he's done good work but no. nobody cares nobody knows him no nope. i looked at this uh no not this guy no you're talking about part five i'm talking about part five yeah because yeah. part six the guy i think he went on to work on the wire and stuff right yes this yeah. is the one so he's that had I a successful really... career I wanted to know if there was one mastermind between four or five and six outside of uh, Mustafa that had creative input, but no, just every no. time. Yeah, it was always somebody new. When you have a brand new creative team, this is why things just go off the rails. You know, if you had somebody, and I, like to the point of the new Halloween films, you have a single creative team and they're working on all three movies. Obviously, it's going to be better just for that fact. Any thoughts on what you think will happen in seven and eight i have no idea i just remember this is my first memory of halloween was h2o and when that was coming out and how big a deal it was and that was when i first heard about john carpenter and and what halloween meant to people and jamie lee curtis was like oh she was a scream queen and when that term kind of came into the public usage i feel like it was right around 98 because i think scream we definitely saw that. Oh, everybody, yeah. Yeah, that made that that was like my first taste of horror, aside from being a little kid and like accidentally seeing Nightmare on Elm Street and all that stuff <laughs> and kind of being terrorized by it. But Scream was the thing that like made it like, oh, this is our movie. Like we're now the Scream generation. So then when H2O was coming along, like you're saying, it kind of fell of a piece with that. All right. <clears throat> End it. Until next time, uh, follow us on social media. Uh, we ha- we're on Twitter. And that's all I'm on. Aaron is on all the other stuff. I'm on it, but I haven't looked at it in months. <laughs> yeah. Uh, follow <laughs> and the I've movie. never been happier. It's it's great, isn't it? Like, I love... I just cannot, I can't get on that anymore. In Twitter, you don't have... All right. Quick sidebar before we end the show, ladies and gentlemen. But I don't even like Twitter. I only go on there when I know you post something about See, these podcasts and then I retweet it. <laughs> I like Twitter because it is the only platform where you don't feel the obligation to follow family and friends. I only follow people that I find interesting in movies. It's all that I really care about. That's true. And that's fun. Like I follow a bunch of film critics and every so often I'll post random film stuff. Um, But yeah, go find the podcast on social. Uh, We have a guy. He's terrible. I hate him. Just make sure you send me a text when you put a new tweet up, and then I can go on and like it. All right? I I will. Absolutely. Otherwise, I won't know. And so, yeah, next episode, it'll be great. Listen to it. Okay, enough talking. Goodbye. All right. Bye.